This week, a class about the 1980s fitness industry and culture in the United States. Professor Natalia Melman Patrazella of the New School talks about new business models for group classes like Jazzercise and innovative career opportunities. You actually saw some of those racket clubs tearing up their squash and racquetball courts and creating dance exercise studios as fitness becomes even more widespread and more popular, but also moves in some ways away from sport to kind of recreational exercise. More in a moment. Hi, and welcome to Fit Nation. We are talking today about 1980s workout culture. Um, This is, I believe, now our third week together virtually. I hope you all are doing well. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you, and we can get right started. Okay, great. So as always, what we're looking at in this class today is about the rise of the American obsession with fitness, um, with fitness culture, with working out, even as the United States is not a particular fit nation. And even as, if anything, in the past 75 to 100 years or so that we look at in this course, Americans have actually become more and more obsessed with the idea of working out as a symbol or a signal of kind of individual virtue and morality, even as um, the ability to do so and having a quote unquote fit body has become another symbol of inequality in this country. So that's the kind of overarching arc, of course, of the, of the class. And today we turn to the 1980s. So the name of the lecture today is a quote from one of the oral histories that I've done for the um, book research that I'm doing, which is on which this course is based. And it's, I would have been a PE teacher. We're going to get there towards the end of class and I'll tell you who said it. But um, that kind of idea that in another historical moment, the people who became architects of the fitness industry would have been physical education teachers is a really important idea, I think, particularly as we talk about the 1980s. Um, Okay, so I would have been a PE teacher, 1980s fitness culture in the United States. Now, I want to start by talking a little bit about the United States in the 1980s, really just broad strokes um, historical context here. Uh, A lot of our students, those of you watching on C-SPAN at the New School are international, so everybody has different levels of preparation and familiarity with U.S. history. I should also mention, I say America there, because even though I'm a U.S. historian, um, you all read for this week Jenny Ellison's article about fat aerobics in Canada in this period. And so while I'm always careful to kind of bound my expertise in the United States, it's really important throughout this class, as we have been all semester, to see which of these phenomena become transnational and also how they might look similar or different across national lines. Um, Okay, so we'll start with real top level um, context for America in the United in the 1980s. Then we go to talk about the making of an industry. This drawing on the, the article that you read by Mark Stern about the rise of the uh, fitness industry from 1960 to 1980, talking in a little more detail about what aspects of that industry look like and also the way that they shaped a workout culture. Then we will get to the quote, which frames our talk today. I would have been a PE teacher. We'll talk about a path not taken, the physical education track, and why a lot of these folks who became so important in the fitness industry of the 1980s and remain so today, why didn't they become PE teachers? It's not, like most historical phenomena, merely a result of individual decisions, but there are structural factors at work too. And so I'm excited to get into that intersection there because it's one of those cases that is just, for me, I didn't anticipate that aspect of this story coming up in my research, but it started bubbling up through oral histories, as I mentioned, and then borne out by some other archival work, which I will talk about. And then we conclude at the end always with, so what? Why do we care? Why is this more than just a little foray into, um, you know, the curiosity of fitness history. Well, I think it's it's about more than that. And I hope by the end you will too. Okay, so let's get started. So let's just recap a little bit of, you know, what we talked about last week. There's a lot going on in the world. We talked about in looking in the 1960s and 70s, a kind of alternative perspective on what U.S. historians often refer to as movement culture, which is often... Um, 
used to refer to uh, used to refer to kind of political activism in that period for things like feminism, gay liberation, against the Vietnam War, kind of progressive political movements. What we did in this period, um, what we did in that same period, was to look at the way that sort of movement culture, as it's conventionally understood, shaped exercise um, period in that culture. But also we expanded the definition of movement culture in the 60s and 70s to say, let's talk about like actual movement culture, what kinds, what forms of exercise were taking hold in this period, and how were they shaped by that moment. One of the big things that transformed exercise um, in that era, which will come up very much today, was the introduction of what we now know as cardio. When Kenneth Cooper, military physician, published his book Aerobics in 1968, he really expanded the definition of exercise to be far beyond weightlifting and calisthenics, which was how it was relatively narrowly defined um, before that. And that I can't underestimate, and we spoke about a lot last week, that revolutionized revolutionized the definition of what exercise was and who could participate in it, and honestly, the kind of bodies that it would create. Um, okay, we talked a little bit, kind of dove in into the case study of the rise of the jogging phenomenon and the kind of idea of the open road. Jogging is like a quintessential cardio form of exercise, seen as 100% um, as sort of objectively salutary and healthful for a kind of increasingly sedentary populace. But also we talked about the kind of countercultural romance that a lot of jogging enthusiasts had about, you know, one person, often one man, and the open road, about a kind of um, back to nature perspective, about a re rejection of technology and technocracy, and that that could, be, uh, that could be embodied by running. And of course, in a moment when exploration through mind-altering substances was quite common, this idea of the runner's high and the endorphins that you could get naturally um, really became kind of part of jogging's mystique in that period. Um, and then we also talked about a simultaneous rise of what we now know as studio fitness, often almost always promoted by women, for women largely, although that's, that has changed now. In that same period of the ninth, late 1960s, late 1970s, you see the beginnings and really the flourishing of um, studio-based fitness workouts, um, things that we'll talk about a little in a little more detail today, things like Jazzercise, founded in 1969, though it really takes hold in the 1980s. Um, things like uh, the bar-based workouts, which we talk about today, Lottie Burke. But that idea, especially for women who are often looked at as scans if they are out in public, alone in the street, particularly exercising, that some of these studio exercises actually created some safer spaces for women to exercise in a moment when exercise for women was becoming much more widely accepted. Um, and there are a lot of contradictions there, which I won't rehash from last week, but which I think um, will come up a little bit today too. All right, so forging ahead. This was the last slide that we had last week. This connection of jogging in the open road to gentrification. This arc from something that was seen as kind of countercultural and anti-materialistic to become something that might be part of the very materialistic conformist culture that it was trying to critique. And if you remember from last week, um, this is an article from 1980 in the Los Angeles Times. The headline is, bite by bite, the croissant culture is swallowing up the ghettos. And um, whereas I don't really associate, we don't associate today croissants with exercise culture, at the time it was a way of saying that kind of you know, affluent, uh, upwardly mobile professionals were gentrifying African-American neighborhoods and bringing with them all their kind of cultural tastes one of them being croissants, one of them being jogging. And you see here, sports such as jogging are solitary um, uh, as our, and our breakfast places and cappuccino cafes designed for the single allowed us to be, allow us to be around people without talking to them. Fast forward, they talk about a lot of the other kind of consumer items that are associated with people who once considered themselves countercultural, sought out these 
what were perceived to be rougher neighborhoods in some ways as part of that countercultural politics. But now jogging and the rest of these things, whole roasted coffee beans, um, fresh flowers, et cetera, croissants, et cetera. The closing line of this op-ed is, our precious urban neighborhoods are well on the way to becoming as homogeneous as the suburbs we fled. And that's kind of a really important theme to think about in this course in general, as you know, but also today. The way that privatization, capitalism, a kind of corporatization of many of these grassroots movements in fitness ends up, I don't want to say bastardizing them or destroying them because there's still very vibrant forms of fitness that exist in our extremely robust private fitness industry, but which you can't deny are overwhelmingly privatized and available as private goods to those who um, can afford them, uh, even as they were often um, introduced with kind of radical ideas um, in mind. Jogging is certainly a pretty good example of that. Okay. So let's do, again, this is real top level, but I want to talk a little bit about some key themes um, in understanding the United States in the 1980s. So that's a picture from the 1990 movie of Bonfire and the Vanities, um, a rendering of Tom Wolfe's famous book about New York City in the 1980s. And if you don't know that book, it's a great novel, never been a better time to go read it. But the protagonist, who's a Wall Street guy, fancies himself a master of the universe. He's married to um, a beautiful, thin, white woman. They are rich. And he, I won't spoil it, but he gets into a car accident, which enmeshes him in that, uh, an African-American neighborhood in New York and in the criminal system and kind of points out a lot of the hypocrisy and social inequality that exists in New York City and I would say in other cities uh, in the United States at that time. That's a very unsatisfying description of the movie, but I can't include the image without telling you. But some of the key themes I think that come out in that book by Tom Wolfe, which are really important to kind of think about this era, is the 1980s is an era of backlash to that movie culture we talked about in the 60s and 70s as a kind of pendulum swing against some of the kind of collective, radical, um, progressive politics which define that era. Also a time where you both have on the, on the level of government a um, kind of austerity policies, lots of cutting of social programmings and of public funding, whereas at the same time a kind of widespread I don't want to say acceptance, celebration of extravagance by individuals um, who can afford it. Bonfire of the Vanities is a really good example of depicting that lifestyle, though it's satire. It's, it's pointing out the hypocrisy there. But some of you might know the movie Wall Street, the phrase greed is good, all of those kind of images of 80s excess, you know, fast cars, cocaine, expensive drugs. That is very, lifestyles of the rich and famous. If this lecture were three hours long, I would show you all these video clips. But that kind of celebration of extreme wealth, while at the same time, social programs are being cut, that is very much um, part of a kind of 80s ethos, um, as historians understand it, and I think people at the time too. With that, unsurprisingly, a whole lot of economic, social, and racial inequality. Um, and and uh, we're going to, I left gender out of there on purpose, because I want to talk about the way this period, through fitness in particular, was both a time when gender inequality continued to be challenged, but also reinscribed by the, gen by the uh, fitness fascinations of the 1980s. Morning in America is Ronald Reagan's um, 1984 presidential campaign slogan. And I put a question mark there because for a lot of people, it was not morning in America. For a lot of people, these cutting of social programmings, um, this kind of ascendant political and cultural conservatism, particularly in the age of HIV AIDS, um, which Ronald Reagan was very late to acknowledge at all as a disease, all of that was not part of a dawning in America it was part of one of the darkest times in, in the United States. And so I think it's really important when we see images like this one that I've put up here to realize that all that glitz and glamour, which by the way, today is very much sort of like um, being re- 
invigorated and a kind of like retro, um, retro celebration of the 80s, that all of that was part of an era in which a lot of people suffered a lot due to these policies. Um, and the last, uh, the last thing on there, I was going to put it on there, but I was, after we had that croissant culture headline last week, it came to my attention that some of you don't know what yuppies are. So yuppie is a term, and that's okay. Um, yuppie is a term that came in use in the 1980s to refer to young urban professionals and all the things that, and the, all the things they like to do, like those croissants and jogging. And um, I was just reading another thing, like triathlons became big. Um, and it's a little bit of a play on hippies, right? And it is uh, often, it was, it was used mockingly, right? These are people who are individualistic. They're kind of in it to climb the ladder on their own. Um, uh, they're kind of not that into collective progressive politics, but rather into personal advancement through climbing the ranks. And that was very much also part of this 80s moment. So of course, I'm leaving a lot out. We didn't even talk about the Cold War in this particular slide, but these are some of the cultural themes which I think frame our discussion of fitness in 1980s United States. Okay, so we've talked a significant amount about presidential fitness in this class and about what was considered kind of um, appropriate for a, for a public figure to participate in in terms of fitness. And if you look here, so this is from a 1983 magazine spread. Um, when This is during Ronald Reagan's first term. That's President Ronald Reagan there working out on, I believe, a Nautilus machine. You read a lot about the history of Nautilus. Um, in uh, Jonathan Black's book for your reading for today. And here, if you take a little closer look at this slide, you can see the president's personal exercise program, how to stay fit. And we're not gonna do a close textual analysis of this slide, though you certainly are welcome to pause and zoom in there at home. But a few things I wanna point out that I think are really good. This image on the right of uh, Reagan chopping wood. He actually, that is, I think, totally of a piece with um, what we talked about earlier in the 20th century with Teddy Roosevelt, like getting out in the great outdoors, celebrating the strenuous life through manly sports, like chopping wood. Um, or in here, he talks about horseback riding too. That, there's a real continuity there. But at least two things in here, I think, maybe possibly three, I think really highlight that this is a different era. One, there's a joke in um, the caption there where Reagan says pumping firewood is what the president calls this activity um, of him splitting splitting logs. So pumping firewood, of course, that's a joke about pumping iron. Remember the 1970s big bodybuilding flick starring Arnold Schwarzenegger that we talked about from the very first day of class even that kind of brought this really weird subculture of musclehead bodybuilders to the kind of center of American um, popular culture, such that even the socially conservative president is making jokes about it. Now, that's so different. Remember when Muscle Beach was shut down for morals charges in the late 1950s? I mean, that's the world that actually Ronald Reagan came from. He was around in California in, the, in those days. And I should say he was a, uh, a Democrat back then, but that's a story for another day. But then the other thing that I think is super interesting here, the main photo for the piece Reagan on an exercise machine in the gym. That is not kind of traditionally masculine Theodore Roosevelt kind of imagery. By 1983, working out in a commercial gym, a man, a man, a straight man, a leader, working on his body in this particular way is considered um, not at all to question his masculinity, but rather to uphold it. This is a puff piece um, that came out in a moment where it's very clear that to be someone who goes to the gym is a positive. This is supposed to reflect positively on the president. And it did, because by, the, by 1983, fitness is in general becoming uncontroversial and a kind of celebrated virtue, such that somebody like Ronald Reagan can do it as can some of the more subcultural bodybuilding figures who were still considered to be rather suspicious. Um, okay, let's keep going. 
Um, all right, so I could spend the whole lecture <laughs> talking about the founder of um, Nautilus. There he is. I am not going to do so because you have you read a lot about the founding of, of Nautilus in your um, in your reading by Jonathan Black today. But one of the things that I think is really important in looking at this um, in looking at this at this moment and at this particular figure is the way that machines really shaped this particular particular history and the proliferation of exercise in the United States. So when he went to, sorry, I have like a small tech issue right here. Let me just look. Sorry. I hope, I think this is still up recording. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so when Arthur Jones, the founder of Nautilus, um, started lifting weights in the 1940s. He was horrified, as you remember from your reading, by the lack of efficiency in lifting traditional barbells. And so he kind of set to work. He didn't have much money back then. He set to work devising what he thought was a more efficient way to lift weights for muscular, for bodybuilding and for overall health and fitness. What came out of that um, tinkering, really, he, this is a guy wh who was deeply skeptical of scientists, who only had a ninth grade education himself, though he said, hey, a ninth grade education in the 1930s is as good as two PhDs today. He ended up creating basically the foundation of the machines that you still see in gyms today, which are those machines, you can see one here, where in order to um, increase weights, you take out a little pin and you put them in and you, um, you know, can raise the weight by making it by putting the pin in, in different places. And as you read in your um, in your text by Jonathan Black, he kind of peddled this around at different trade shows and very quickly it became the standard in gyms. And that is really important in this theme that we've been discussing in this class of making gyms be places where more people would exercise than just, you know, hardcore bodybuilders. So this um, was, it was less intimidating to a lot of people because it wasn't as clear how much weight you were lifting. You know, you didn't have to have to heave around all of these plates and it really, really um, revolutionized exercise. And so I think I think we have got to give, um, we've got to give him that. At the same time, as you gathered from your reading as well, and this is like the part of his life that I could spend so much time on. Um, funny, I did not mean to assign this reading when we would be, our nation would be in the height of this obsession with Tiger King, but Jones was a very Joe Exotic kind of figure. He was um, into collecting big game. He had hundreds of elephants, reptiles, um, I believe he had bears too. He wasn't a big cat guy, but he had hundreds of wild animals um, on his property in Ocala, Florida. And he was a he he was a guy with very contrarian ideas and who was not um, afraid to share them. I really debated actually showing you some video of him talking, and I'm going to send around the link. Um, but it's pretty objectionable language. To give you a sense, he had six wives. Um, up until the end of his life, he he continued to get married and get divorced. He married, I believe, all of these women, or at least four of the six of them, when they were under 20 years old. He went on record calling his fourth wife an old bag when she was at 24. Um, I watched one interview with him where he said, someone asked him what his thoughts on women. He said, oh, I think women are great. I think you should, everybody should own several of them. All men should own several of them. So he had these really um, offensive <laughs> ideas. And um, that has made him unfortunately today, um, a bit of a folk hero among some like hardcore men's rights groups who see him as a guy who was speaking truth to power very early and who refused to kind of bow to emerging ideas of what was not yet called political correctness, but which came to be so. Um, and I could go on and on with lots and lots of examples of um, that kind of behavior for him. And I should say, so the men's rights people celebrate him today for those ideas. But then in fitness circles, I would say, despite those ideas, he is actually still celebrated as well. So some people call him the founder of HIT, high intensity interval training. And you see on fitness blogs everywhere, um, a kind of focus on like this hero in the fitness industry without um, focusing on some of the really objectionable things that he said and did. One of the things that I want to point out is 
it's often common in um, the, writing the history of any kind of period to focus like only on the famous people. Some people call this great man history. And I think the focus on Jones and the impact of his Nautilus machines sometimes can err in that direction. So one of the things in the research that I've been doing that I found really interesting is asking like people, how did Nautilus change your life? How did, you know, what, what impact did Jones and his innovations in fitness have, have on your life? And one person I talked to who asked specifically for this, this, for her name not to be included in this story, but she went on to become very famous in the women's fitness space. And she started early on in her career as a sales representative for him selling Nautilus machines because she said, hey, they were the best machines on the market. But actually... When she went to visit him in his huge ranch in um, Florida, she was actually so horrified by his um, utter racism and language I won't utter here that she actually um, left um, as a sales representative for Nautilus and left a lot of money on the table. So whenever you go to the gym and work out on one of those machines with the pins, remember, um, you know, that it, it has this history a lot of people don't know. I should say that his son actually went on um, to develop Hammer Strength, which is an even more widespread um, brand that you will see around today too. So I don't believe his son shared all of these, the, the same ideas that he did. So um, I will only attribute those to, to, to Senior. Okay, so at that same piece, so he invents Nautilus. He comes from this very kind of like macho background, which it's funny. He got in a lot of conflict with some of the traditional bodybuilders who saw this like fancy new high tech machine as being, as getting in the way of real lifting, like barbell heavy lifting gyms. So he had that conflict with those guys. But in many, but he, even as he expanded, who came into gyms, he was somebody who did not have any kind of progressive, positive ideas about inclusiveness um, as part of his mission at all. Now, at the same time, the, uh, um, the fitness industry is exp expanding in a very different way. We talked a little bit about the founding of Jazzercise last week and how in 1969, this dancer, Judy Shepard, went to a YMCA to get her fitness levels tested. The fitness exam they had didn't even have metrics to measure a, a woman's body. And they were also shocked that just a dancer could be such a powerful, um, so, so strong. So she goes on to create Jazzercise, this dance cardio um, format, which has a really interesting business story, which is often not told. Jazzercise, which again, dance cardio, there's a guy in this picture here, but it's mostly women. Um, it is meant to enable women who might be self-conscious about taking time for themselves to exercise or about looking at themselves in the mirror when they exercise um, to kind of free them from all of that and allow them to move together for kind of health and fitness. Now, the business side of this, I think is super interesting. Oops. Oh no, I'm going to have to go back to that one. So um, Jazzercise becomes a franchise. And in what a franchise means is that individual people, rather than working for Jazzercise Inc. or working for Judy Shepard, who was Judy Shepard Massette by then, would go and pay a fee in order to start their own little Jazzercise businesses. Now, by 1984, you can see by this uh, little clip right here, Jazzercise is the second fastest growing franchise business in the country after Domino's Pizza. Those two might go hand in hand, right? And a lot, by the way, uh, quite a few... Um, quite a few like fast food things on there too. But the, one of the reasons this is important is one, because the franchise model continues to be a really important form of growth for the fitness industry. And it has been for a long time, but two, Jazzercise franchisees are almost 100% women. So are the participants. And so it becomes part of this growing fitness industry where women are some of the real prime movers here. And I've interviewed lots of people kind of in and around the Jazzercise world. And one of the things that a lot of them said is that these franchisees, what they were, they were women who were staying at home um, with their kids or women who were kind of in between jobs because of their either their husband's work or other family commitments. And this allowed them to have some kind of economic self-determination and work and a sense of community while they attended to these other commitments. And I think that's an important story about this that, let, let get, that falls out of the picture when we just think about leotards, leg warmers, and the kind of aesthetic of that period which was pretty cool. Um, but let's go back for a second. I do want to point out again, in avoiding a great man or great woman um, theory of history, just like um, 
Jones is not the only guy who made exercise equipment, as you know from your Jonathan Black reading, but also Judy Shepard Massat was not the only one doing dance cardio, dance exercise. Jackie Sorensen, the same year as Miss Set, um, creates something very similar called aerobic dancing. And she becomes extremely popular on the East Coast. And she has classes at YMCA's and kind of all over the place. And one of the things that I think is really interesting about both of these women and how these businesses came about is they were both living kind of adjacent to military bases. Um, Judy Shepard Massette had relocated to San Diego County and lived near the military base there. And so a lot of her students were military wives who were, you know, in the sh- often there because their husbands had been deployed and in the kind of the shadow of this like hyper masculine military complex. They find jazzercise. Many of them became certified instructors and franchisees because when their husbands got re- reassigned, they didn't want to lose their exercise. So they had to learn it to bring it with them. And that's part of how that business spread throughout the world. And it, it really did, and very quickly. Jackie Sorensen was also on a military base with her husband in Guam, I believe it's right in this article. She was an Air Force wife. Um, it doesn't say where. I'm almost positive it was in Guam. And she too kind of was, you know, at the behest of her husband's schedule and work, but created this incredible program there that ended up, again, mostly for women being a real source of, you know, self-affirmation, exercise strength, et cetera. I do want to point out, again, without doing a close reading of this piece right here, that a lot of these programs, even as I fully stand by the idea that these absolutely empowered women and women and created new opportunities for women, you know, some of the language, this is for the grossly obese, Sorensen claims, aerobic dancing could be dangerous. There's a lot of kind of weight loss talk in a lot of these programs. And, you know, I think still today, but even more so then, women's fitness was often talked about primarily as a form of weight loss rather than anything else. Um, okay, so we've got the machine side of the industry, right? Nautilus machines, you read about life cycle, the bikes, um, the Pilates reformer you read about in your reading too. Now you have studios and like renting rooms in YMCAs or within other gyms or in health spas. That's where you have a lot of that dance cardio stuff happening. But then you also have the rise of the health club as social club. And I point this out here because this is an interesting story of how fitness culture bounces in and out of art and reality. So there was this uh, story that ran in Rolling Stone um, called here, you can see, Looking for Mr. Goodbody in the early 1980s. And it was about a club in, in Los Angeles called the Sports Connection. Now, almost everybody that I've interviewed for this book project about who was in fitness in LA in the 1980s mentions the sports connection. Like this was the place to be seen. People said it was so much a kind of singles bar environment that they called it the sports erection. Um, And it was such a kind of new place. The idea that a gym was not a sweaty dungeon where a bunch of suspicious guys went to heave iron, but it was where the beautiful people hung out. It was a new idea. It was considered a very California idea. So this guy, Aaron Latham, who you see his name in the byline here, he goes to California New York journalist writes a story about it, runs in, in, in Rolling Stone. It becomes kind of such a popular phenomenon that uh, they make a movie about it called Perfect, which I recommend you all watch. Um, someone said it's the only movie out there that has like a full length actual aerobic series in it. Like you could actually learn the choreography from watching it. Um, and John Travolta and Jamie Lee Curtis star in it. Here you can see these are the, these are the, uh, the stars. And um, it's really something. It gets kind of panned at the box office, but it's something that in the mid-1980s, there's enough fascination with fitness as a phenomenon and with a gym. It's set at the Sports Connection that there's a major feature film about it. And I should say there's an interesting regional aspect to it also. Like the whole narrative there is that like this kind of smart, savvy New Yorker goes out to California to learn what these like brain dead, fitness obsessed people are, um, are doing out there. And Jamie Lee Curtis who's the star aerobics instructor, there's a presumption that like the fact that she went to be an aerobics instructor, even if she's really good at it, suggests like there's something wrong with her, like that she's damaged in some way. Um, And so I suggest reading, watching that. I think it's on Amazon Prime, just to kind of wrap your head around um, a lot about the way that the culture was seeing fitness, still with some suspicion, but with increasing fascination um, during that period.
Okay. So what was most responsible probably or who, who and what were most responsible for proliferating 1980s fitness culture outside of brick and mortar gyms? Well, brick and mortar gyms, as you know from your reading on the rise of the industry, were booming from like 1960 to 1990. The growth is exponential in the fitness industry. Um, and as you also know from that piece, what's happening in those clubs is changing. Like the professional organization goes from being called the um, the the racket, uh, sorry, the racket and sports association to racket clubs and health clubs. It's IRSA, and um, I'm not going to forget the name, the exactly how to say the uh, the the acronym. But what's really important is your as the article that you read for homework pass points out, and as some of the people I've interviewed have pointed out too, is that you actually saw some of those racket clubs tearing up their squash and racquetball courts and creating dance exercise studios as fitness becomes even more widespread and more popular, but also moves in some ways away from sport to kind of recreational exercise. But let's get back to the lady in the leotard here. So this is Jane Fonda. Jane Fonda was already a celebrated actress and controversial activist um, by, the, by 1979 when she finds, founds her workout studio on Robertson Boulevard in Los Angeles. It's actually not well known that she was at the time married to Tom Hayden, um, the left-wing activist, founder of Students for a Democratic Society. She actually founded the workout studio to support California's campaign for economic democracy, his organization. And um, one of the things I think is really interesting about that that she wrote about in her memoir is that even though she was channeling millions of dollars into this, um, his nonprofit, he was always really dismissive of the workout studio and really thought it was kind of silly and superficial. And, you know, what are you ladies doing in there? Meanwhile, um, the, one of the ways that she made dance exercise so popular was she was already a celebrity. So it had her name attached to it, but two VHS video cassettes. So no matter how many more people were coming into gyms, no matter how many more clubs were being built, nothing could compare with having this videotape in your hand. Not that cheap, by the way. Fitness videos in those days were like $40 or $50, but that you could bring home, you could pop into your VCR, and you could do it anytime. And that was really responsible for promoting and proliferating fitness culture far beyond any brick and mortar environment. Um, I'll also say, and this is super interesting, you know, I spoke a lot last week and alluded to it a little a bit this week about the way that like jazzercise in particular, but a lot of these dance exercise formats were not, even as they were, I think, very genuinely kind of pro-woman, they were not overtly feminist like at all. They were still talking about thin thighs and kind of really did not seem to me or I think to themselves either at that time kind of of a piece with the feminist activism of the era. Jane Fonda was very different. She in her book, which is which was came with the workout. She talks about how exercise is about bodily self-determination, how she wants this book and this program to be as much for secretaries as Beverly Hills women. She talks about, she has this whole feminist line basically about reclaiming her own body, which is very, very different from um, what you, the language that you hear from a lot of other dance exercise women. At the same time, she gets criticized a lot for perpetuating a kind of slim femininity and a white femininity and an affluent femininity um, through through her workout. And um, yeah, and that I mean that continues to be something that that she's cr criticized for, even though it's not an aspect of her goals. Um, so this is an image from Jenny Ellison's article that you read about fat women's aerobics culture in the 1980s. And I love, love, love that article um, because I think it highlights so much the way that even as fitness culture was in many ways deeply problematic in this period, the answer by people who might resist it wasn't, I'm not going to work out. It was like, I'm going to remake and appropriate this thing and make it my own in a way that feels more inclusive and honest and genuine. And so Ellison's article is so great, I think, because she emphasizes groups like this one, Largest Life Fitness, and other fat women who um, realized the kind of thin um, 
dominant dominance of thinness in a lot of these exercise spaces or presumption that the goal of going there is to become thin. And they say, no, like essentially don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, like community movement, exercise, health. It's awesome. But we want to do it in a way that affirms bodies like us as more than a stop on the way to becoming thin as something good in their own right. And I think that's a really powerful um, angle because a lot of times there's a kind of simplistic critique critique of fitness culture, that all it is is perpetuating a thin ideal. And while that's often not wrong, I think that overlooks really important stories like this. Um, another group of marginalized people who are so important to the creation of contemporary fitness culture are, of course, LGBTQ people. So that there is, there would be no gym culture in this country without queer people, like full stop, no question. And so I want to just pause for a second and talk about the way that that operated. So this gentleman on the left, that's John Blair. He was both a um, gym entrepreneur and a nightclub impresario. And those things were very closely intertwined for him. He talks about being a young gay man in Los Angeles in 1970. And get this, this was in his New York Times obituary. And about going to the, um, going, going to what he going to the first gay gym in Los Angeles and having it a place where he could find Nautilus machines and wear tube socks and kind of be himself. And to me, having just put together all that material about Arthur Jones, who was like, homophobic, racist, misogynist, and then to hear John Blair, who was a huge activist, um, who's queer himself and a huge activist for LGBTQ rights, talk about the presence of Nautilus machines at the gym being a kind of, you know, one sign it was a good place or one sign it was a place of solace, to me is a really important point about the way that um, particular spaces or devices or products or experiences get remade and reused used by everyday people. Um, And I think that's important to think about when we think about the history of any of these phenomena. So Blair um, has a gym in LA and then he has most of New York also has gyms in New York and nightclubs. And he talks about how during HIV AIDS, um, going to the gym and having what he called the Chelsea boy physique, the kind of fit muscular body became such an important way to showcase that you weren't sick, you weren't wasting away from HIV AIDS. And so wearing that signifier of health on your body was um, one way that kind of fitness culture operate in that period. Now this other Molly Fox studios over here, I had the great pleasure of interviewing Molly Fox, who is like still considered one of the leaders in the fitness industry. And she used a really great term, which some of you have probably heard in your other courses, a third place to describe the role of studios, her studio in particular, and and others in, in, in that period in New York City. And she talks about the marginalization of LGBTQ people in that period and the way that these gyms were places where particularly in New York, where she had her studio in Chelsea, you see there, there was a kind of place where you weren't going to be marginalized. Marginalized. You weren't going to be seen as diseased. You weren't going to be seen as othered. And that these were incredible sources of community in that regard. And so I think that's really important too to like disaggregate when we think of gym culture, the big sports connection, the independently owned studios like Molly Fox, the, um, you know, um, equipment aspect of the industry that we learned about from Jonathan Black and through Nautilus and to see they all intersect and they're all kind of part of this amorphous thing called gym culture, but they all have very different functions and can and all serve in some ways as in some ways as places that were some are excluded and in places which um, are also a force for inclusivity as well. Um, so what I wanted to do for this very last bit of class here is talk about this path not taken. So what you, let me pause for a second and explain what I'm talking about here. Um, one of the things that um, kind of bubbled up through my oral history interviews that I was surprised about is that I've interviewed all of these luminaries from um, the 1980s in particular, this kind of high point when to put a to put one digit on it, by the middle of the 1980s, 22 million people are doing aerobics in um, the United States. That is something that no one had ever even heard about, probably 15 years earlier, most of them even 10 years earlier. And what I kept hearing from people who 
um, came up through this period and became really these like big shots in the industry was either I was a phys ed teacher, I was a phys ed major, or I well, can you imagine if I'd been born in another era, I would have been a PE teacher. And I started to kind of think about that, that all of a sudden there was this boom in this private industry that created all these opportunities in the, a private realm for people who are extraordinarily talented people, by the way, who would have otherwise gone into teaching people. PE. And so that became another kind of avenue to look at how the rise of this industry has, I think, in some ways um, contributed to these kind of austerity policies, which have drained really quality physical education from um, the public realm. So here are some examples of intersections, which a lot of people told me about as well. So Jackie Sorensen, who you remember founded Aerobic Dancing, um, she was involved in the Presidential Council for Youth Fitness. She wrote physical education curriculum, you can see here. Um, and then here, this is in 1990, President George Bush the first appoints um, Arnold Schwarzenegger as uh, head of the Presidential Council on Fitness, which we talked a lot about, if you remember back in with uh, Dwight Eisenhower and John F. Kennedy. Now that this, I don't, I want to pause here because this is remarkable. I mean, I, we talked about how marginal um, Muscle Beach was and how marginal weightlifting was. The idea that a Republican conservative president would be appointing Arnold Schwarzenegger as the head of the like very staid presidential council on fitness, that says a lot about the mainstreaming of workout culture in the United States. States, that this dance aerobics um, instructor who is really promoting exercise for girls would be writing PE curriculum, that does suggest um, a real change that I don't want to minimize. On the other hand, I want to close by talking about a couple of few people who talked about that path not taken. So that quote, can you imagine I would have been a phys ed teacher, comes from this woman, Tammy Lee Webb, who is really famous. She still calls herself Ms. Buns of Steel. She became very, very successful during the 80s and 90s, particularly through fitness infomercials. She started in a whole lot of DVDs and um, did very well for herself through that. Now, when I interviewed her, she told me that, you know, she was a kid who grew up um, in rural California around a lot of boys. She was super sporty. She was into weightlifting. She ended up competing in weightlifting. She went to school and was the only girl in her class at Chico State to graduate in exercise science. And um, she said that if she hadn't graduated when she did in the late 1970s, her really only opportunity would have been to go and be a phys ed teacher. A career path, which looking back when I talked to her just a couple of years ago on the enormous career that she built for herself, seemed like it would have been a real missed opportunity. She went after school, she went on to teach aerobics and other kinds of fitness at um, on cruises, at a kind of luxury spa called the Golden Door. She was big on, this, on the fitness convention circuit, which was just born in the 1980s. And she really um, became somebody who shaped and created this industry and who, and I don't fault her for this, feels like she lucked out by being born at the right time when these opportunities existed. Because for a girl like her, born 10, 15 years early, she would have ended up as a PE teacher. Being a PE teacher, I think most of you know, because we've talked about it before, particularly in moments of austerity around social spending and public spending, is not a particularly glamorous lifestyle. Although I give a lot of kudos to people who do it, because I think it's really important. Similarly, I want to focus on, on these folks here. That's Kathy and Peter Davis in this picture here. They're married. They're still married today. And that is Carol Scott. So all three of these folks, um, uh, all three of these folks um, have some connection to that same kind of story. And, and, and I, I group them all together here because the, the spoiler alert where they end up is they, Kathy and Peter Davis founded really the first professional association for at first aerobics instructors called IDEA, International Dance Exercise Association. It's an original acronym. And then Carol, and that was in California. They both went to school in San Diego and, and started that. And then Carol Scott, a few years later, started essentially an East Coast version of that called um, ECA, East Coast Alliance, ECA Fitness. And all of them 
Kathy and the, these Kathy and Peter came out of the tennis world, collegiate tennis, and Kathy and Carol told me rather similar stories of being jocks, of studying phys ed, um, and, and of be graduating in the early 1980s into this dynamic realm of commercial fitness that they never would have imagined existed before. And by, um, and of having that opportunity to take up that felt like one that you just couldn't give up. And Carol, I, who I spoke to more recently expressed, um, I think a really interesting perspective on the difference of those paths that lay before her. She was like, I could go be creating programming and working out with like, you know, all all of these people from different walks of life and being at the center of this dynamic industry, or I could go roll out the balls in the gymnasium and follow this pre-existing curriculum, which I had very little power to change. And that's a story that I heard again and again. And I point this out because all of these folks here not only chose personal careers in fitness, but went on to really create some of the professional infrastructure for the industry and for, um, for industry professionals, which did not exist before. Um, and just so you know, like what was one of the things that those organizations created was um, kind of kind of uh, conventions and you, what the way it would work. And it still does in some places. You apply with your programming, whether there you see spinning or step or whatever it was. And then you present like an academic conference and different fitness professionals come and see your workout. I don't know exactly what's being presented there, but that was at ECA Fitness where full disclosure, I have presented as well quite a few years ago. I was backup talent though. I was like these people in the back, but different outfits. Um, okay. So um, last example of this. Um, I've interviewed both of these folks. It's Elizabeth Halfpap and Fred DeVito. They are the kind of power couple of bar fitness in America, co-founders of Exhale. Um, and they worked at with Lottie, with the Lottie Burke method when it first came to the United States in the 70s and, 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 1980s, and 1980s and onward. Lydia Bach right here is um, the woman who brought the Lottie Burke method to the U.S. We talked about Lottie Burke last week. And Fred DeVito in telling me his story and how he came to it, he was a PE teacher and he had a union job and it was secure. But then his, his I think then girlfriend, now wife, Elizabeth, was a dancer and she was working at Body Burke. And it was at that point, no men were even allowed in on the premises, either in New York and later in Los Angeles too. And he went, he got a kind of side job there working the desk. And then um, he started getting trained and he made this really tough decision, which he said his parents just didn't understand in some ways at the beginning of him leaving this secure teaching job to go and work in this really fledgling fitness industry. And I was really taken by the way that he described why he did that. And he said uh, to me, and I think to a lot of you, particularly being at the new school, leaving like the public realm to work in private industry feels like that's somehow a move towards a more like exclusive or exclusionary realm, which in some ways I think that instinct is right. But what DeVito explained to me, I think this was really opened my eyes in a lot of ways. He said, look, when I was teaching PE, I was teaching to the kids who were already jocks, the kids who were out of shape or humiliated or felt excluded. They would get a note or sit on the side or not try. And the way the curriculum was structured, it only perpetuated that. There was like no opportunity for me to actually get people to love movement or to create kind of a more collectively inspiring environment. He said in the studio world, which was so new, um, there was actually that opportunity to create those kind of environments. And so that's the kind of thing that you hear a lot. Um, and in this particular, in, in this particular case as well, um, he just has a really, possesses a really interesting honor, which is that he was the first man apparently allowed ever into one of the Lottie Burke classes. And this Lydia Bach here, who they worked with for years, Lydia Bach was the woman who brought the Lottie Burke method from Europe to the United States. Um, okay. So I want to close right now. I think we went a little bit later than, than I would have thought, just with this very strange image. That's, that's uh, Lydia Bach, possibly, not the same photo shoot, but that's Lydia Bach and Arnold Schwarzenegger locked in this rather strange arm wrestling competition, grinning arm wrestling. And um, I do not have a date for this class, but for this particular image, but it was used in a promotion for the Lottie Burke method about you know how to get strong. And I close on this one because I think you can see that 
one of the things that happens in the 1980s in this crazy and divergent and multifaceted history of fitness in the United States is that you start to see a lot of convergence. That something like the Lottie Burke method, born out of dance on Man- in Manchester Street in London for kind of society ladies, and Arnold Schwarzenegger, who comes out of like the muscle beach of super macho male bodybuilding culture, there is a kind of mainstream convergence that's happening in this period where there is a much wider spread celebration of the pursuit of individual fitness as an objective good that's happening across the culture. Yet at the same time, in a moment of defunding of public institutions and austerity, for all that enthusiasm about fitness, what you're seeing boom is the private sector, the rise of private clubs, VHS tapes for sale, studios, franchise business, whatever. It's not all one thing, and they all function in ways that are great for some people and not so great for other people. But it's the private realm, which is really, really booming in this period, but for the very um, public, but I think not always with a lot of substance, professions of support for fitness culture that you see with Ronald Reagan on a Nautilus machine in a magazine spread, or George um, Bush uh, pointing uh, a bodybuilder to the Presidential Council for Youth, Youth Fitness. So on that note, I will let you go. I look very forward to hearing your thoughts on this topic. If you're joining us from C-SPAN, and you're, I'm very easy to find online. Thank you so much for joining me. Have a wonderful week. And thank you, C-SPAN, for inviting me on. Bye. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Lectures in History podcast. Are you looking for new reading material in 2022? Listen to the About Books podcast. On the latest episode, New York Times book review editor Pamela Paul talks about some of the New York Times notable books of the year and her latest book, 100 Things We've Lost to the Internet. Find the About Books podcast and all of C-SPAN's podcasts wherever you listen.